Good evening. Good evening. And welcome to the American Antiquarian Society and to our inaugural Jane Ramsey Pomeroy Lecture. We're here in Antiquarian Hall in Worcester, Massachusetts on the ancestral homelands of the Nipmuc tribal community who remain a vibrant presence in central Massachusetts to this day. We have a large audience watching us on YouTube as well as a robust audience right here in the Learning Lab in Antiquarian Hall. The program is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel following this live stream. I'm Scott Casper. I have the honor of serving as president of the American Antiquarian Society, and this is a special evening for us. Tonight's lecture by Ron Tyler, whom I'll introduce in a few minutes, is named for Jane Ramsey Pomeroy, an exceptional scholar, printer, bibliographer, and collector with whom AAS enjoyed a 40-year relationship. Jane's bibliographic passion, in the words of AAS curator of children's literature, Laura Wozowitz, was the life and work of Alexander Anderson, the foremost American woodcut engraver of the late 18th and 19th centuries. And I want to give credit to my colleague, Laura Wozowitz, whose obituary for Jane appeared in the Grolier Club Journal last year and is the basis for some of this biography. Jane sought out the books and ephemera containing Anderson's engravings and collected many of those works herself along with Anderson's engraving blocks, a collection that she generously donated to AAS. Her research into Anderson's production took her to many repositories, notably the New York Public Library and AAS, and led to three significant works. Her three-volume Alexander Anderson, 1775 to 1870, Wood Engraver and Illustrator, an Annotated Bibliography, published in 2005, with 2,332 entries, as well as Jane's essays on Anderson and his work. Her annotated edition of Alexander Anderson's New York City Diary, 1793-99, which was published in 2014, covering the dreadful years when Anderson lost much of his family to the yellow fever epidemic in New York. And third, Alexander Anderson's America, the catalog for her exhibition at the Grolier Club in 2019. Jane Pomeroy understood Anderson so well, not just because she was an indefatigable researcher, which she was, but also because she was a printer who apprenticed with R. Stanley Nelson at the National Museum of American History. At her burnt coat press, Jane printed miniature books that were works of art in their own right. She donated her press equipment to the University of Maine at Machias, where its book arts studio continues to teach aspiring printers and where Jane's example and inspiration live on to this day. Jane Pomeroy was elected to AAS membership in 1994, and she and her husband Bob Pomeroy, who were married for 60 years until her death in 2020, were dear friends of AAS. Many of our staff members remember very fondly, and some of them are in this room tonight, Jane's visits to AAS, her presence in the reading room, and her work with so much of our collections to find Alexander Anderson's woodcuts. In Jane's memory and in her honor, her husband Bob created this occasional lecture series to showcase printing and printmaking. And we are grateful to both Jane and Bob for their generosity and for their example for the American Antiquarian Society. And so it is entirely appropriate that the first Jane Ramsey Pomeroy lecture will be given this evening by Ron Tyler on his recently published book, Texas Lithographs, A Century of History in Images. For those here in the room with us tonight, we have several of the Texas materials from our own collections on view tonight as well as some materials showing the technology of lithography. It's great stuff. If you didn't check it out on your way in, please check it out on your way out. And now it's a delight to introduce Ron Tyler, who embodies in many ways the multiple communities that connect here at AAS. 
the community of scholars, the community of curators, the community of people who believe in the study, the deep study of books and images. Ron Tyler served as director of the Eamon Carter Museum of American Art in Fort Worth from 2006 until his retirement in 2011. Having begun his career also at the Eamon Carter Museum from 1969 as curator of history until 1986. In between, he was professor of history and director of the Texas State Historical Association at the University of Texas at Austin. Ron is the editor or author of more than two dozen books, including Western Art, Western History, Collected Essays, The Art of Texas, 250 Years, Prince of the West, Audubon's Great National Work, the Royal Octavo Edition of the Birds of America, and Alfred Jacob Miller, Artist as Explorer. Ron was elected to AAS membership in April 1986, and we are delighted to welcome him and his wife Paula back to AAS for tonight's lecture. Ron, the floor is yours. Scott, thank you for those very kind words. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, my Uber driver asked me today why I was in town, and I said, I'm giving a talk tonight. He said, on what? I said, on Texas lithographs. Do you think I'll get a crowd? <laughs> he said, well, I think I'm busy. <laughs> so I'm glad you're here. Thank you. This is a project that uh, I worked on for a good long while. It started um, probably in 1986. 86 was a sesquicentennial year for Texas. And we needed an exhibition on Texas. So I suggested we do a small exhibition on Texas lithographs. And we did, probably 50 or 60 pieces maybe. And I thought, well, I'll do a small catalog, maybe a list. And I kept adding and adding and adding. And over the years, uh, the book has, I think, about 450 illustrations. And of course, the ones I left out, I'll tore my heart out, each one of them. At any rate, this is the result. Texas lithographs, a century of images, because it's one of my primary concerns that images and history really intersect at almost every uh, angle that you can approach them from. And history is really enlightened by images, sometimes in ways not so obvious, I think. And I've been preaching that uh, idea to historians for a long time. Actually, I think I have a convert or two, but uh, uh, not that many. Anyway, it's a lot of fun regardless. In the winter of 1882-83, a young Charles Seringo, a um, Texas cowboy who had maybe an eighth grade education, found himself in uh, Indian Territory with eight other Texas cowboys. Wintertime, they were bored to tears. They decided that they needed some literature to uplift them. So they said, okay, we'll pay a dime for every curse word and for every grayback that we pick and throw away without killing. We'll put those dimes in a jar. We'll create a, a fund to subscribe to something that will lift us up. And there were a number of choices they could have made. Maybe Scribner's Magazine or perhaps uh, Harper's New Monthly Magazine, really good magazines that I've read a few myself in doing all my research. But what did they pick? <laughs> the Police Gazette. The sex, crime, girly, pinup magazine of the day. Seringo so asked a couple of illiterate Texas cowboys, why in the world did you pick that wicked magazine? And they said, because we can read the pictures. And that is a transformational idea that we still go with today, a transnational visual culture. I'm going to talk about two things that happened in the 19th century, briefly about lithography and its development, and also about the iconic Texas century, the 19th century. It was a very important century, needless to say, in Texas history. First lithography, Alois Senefelder 
invented lithography and or created lithography in 1798, as we all know, uh, a revolutionary printing process because it printed from a flat surface rather than from uh, an engraved or an etched surface. Those were the only two methods of picture printing up until the invention of lithography. It was easier, it was less expensive, and it grew rapidly. It wasn't easy. The operator had to be very skilled, but it grew rapidly. Here's a quote from the U.S. Literary Gazette. The cheapness and facility of the lithographic process, the number and goodness of the impressions to be obtained from a single plate, the spirit of these impressions, they being facsimiles of the original drawing, show that it is a most valuable substitute for copper plate printing in all but the highest branches of art. The, each reproduction was so accurate that Sinefelder referred to them as duplicate originals. So in his thinking, the print was the original and there were duplicate originals. From the Daily Quincy Herald, the pictorial process provided a series of truthful representations of various points, which afford probably a better idea of the lay of the land the general appearance and characteristic of the country than is to be had from the most elaborate written descriptions. So they said it better than I can. Pictures do indeed tell a story. So let's begin that Texas story. In 1821, when Stephen F. Austin first came into Texas, he said, when I explored this country in 1821, it was a wild, howling, indeterminable, interminable solitude from Sabine to Behar. At the end of the 19th century, Texas is the only southern state which is fully imbued with the spirit of northern enterprise. <laughs> the railroad was the change agent. And former President U.S. Grant, when he was in Galveston in 1880, said Texas is an empire in itself. So that's quite a bit of development in the space of less than a century. And lithography tells a story about that development. This young man is a French veteran. He's standing on the shores of a river, looking longingly at the boats in the river, like maybe he wanted to go back home if he could. Holding his hand over his heart, some say making a Masonic sign. The tree stumps in the foreground tell the story. They have chopped down the trees to build the village in the background. This is a, a cover of a song sheet published in Paris in 1818, and it is the first Texas lithograph. Now, how did this lithograph come to be published in Paris in 1818? Well, after the Napoleonic War, French veterans could work only on their family farm, nowhere else. So there were lots of French veterans wandering around with nothing to do and causing a lot of trouble. Uh, many of them came to the United States. There was a successful colony founded in Alabama. And there was a colony attempted in Texas at Chandazeal on the Trinity River, uh, which is uh, near present day Liberty, Texas. Uh, it didn't last long. The Spaniards uh, found out about it and sent an army to uh, roust them out. And as soon as the French heard the army was coming, they just packed up and left. So it lasted less than six months. But in Paris, it became a cause célèbre. The anti-monarchist used it as an example of, you see what this awful monarchy has forced on our French heroes, the veterans who fought for our republic. So it was a clash of politics in France, and it, it produced all kinds of material, lithographs, plates, uh, maps, books. It became a call, banquets. Uh, they collected money to send to the poor French refugees in uh, Texas. Well, by the time the money arrived, they of course had uh, disbanded. It went to the mayor in New Orleans and he distributed it to the, the veterans who had settled in the New Orleans area. And that was the end of Sean de Zeal. But uh, we have the lithographic and engraving and uh, China remains of it in, in, in this form. That nevertheless was the first Texas lithograph. Of course, there was no lithography in Texas at that time, nor in Mexico, 
The first lithographic shop in Mexico was created by the man on the right, uh, uh, Lenate is his name, Claudio Lenate, an Italian immigrant who left uh, Europe because he had uh, participated in some revolutionary activities and was threatened with prison or worse himself. So he came to Mexico and founded a lithographic workshop in Mexico and uh, published what is probably the first separate printed map of Texas, a copy of one of Stephen F. Austin's map of Texas. Mr. Lenate got himself in trouble in uh, Mexico and soon had to leave there. Uh, I'll more on that in just a moment. Uh, meanwhile, General Mier E. Tehran was given the map that may be the only copy that he made, I'm not sure, it's the only one that exists today, uh, for his expedition into Texas. In 1828, Mier E. Tehran came to Texas because the boundary between the United States and Texas had never been surveyed. Uh, United States and Mexico, I should have said, had never been surveyed. So Mier E. Tehran wanted to survey the area between the Red River and the Sabine, which was the area that hadn't been surveyed. So he apparently brought this map with him. According to the uh, best authorities, all the handwriting on the map is Mier E. Tehran's notes as he was uh, proceeding on the uh, expedition. What happened in 1829 in Mexico? Well, first of all, they abolished slavery, which was a problem for Texas and led ultimately to the Texas Revolution. Um, but uh, also, they stopped immigration from the United States. They passed the law of April 6, 1830, that basically said no more immigration into Mexico from a state adjacent to Mexico. Well, the United States was adjacent to Mexico, so no more Americans in Texas. That was the idea. That was another cause of the Texas Revolution. Mr. Lenate, meanwhile, went to Belgium and using the uh, material that he had gathered in uh, Mexico, published a beautiful book of uh, uh, civil costumes, he called it, in, uh, in Belgium, including uh, information on the Apaches, which he says uh, were from the Colorado River all the way to California, and then a portrait of General Felisola, who was one of the generals who would soon be with Santa Ana trying to put down the revolution in uh, Texas. Now, the man who started everything in Texas was Stephen F. Austin, of course. And Stephen F. Austin, as you can see, was uh, characterized by William Howard, who was a British artist in Mexico City, probably after this portrait by, uh, of Daniel Boone by, uh, it's a lithographic portrait, J.O. Lewis, after Chester Harding's portrait of Daniel Boone. Austin probably had seen that lithograph, might have even had a copy with him, uh, and gave, gave it to uh, Howard and said, you know, picture me as the man who brought immigrants into Texas like Daniel Boone brought Americans through the Cumberland Gap. Interestingly enough, though, when the picture of Sam Houston was published in 1833, he also was depicted in a very similar pose and costume with his dog, although he lacks the uh, rifle. So both these people, uh, no doubt, saw them sort of in the same Daniel Boone uh, character, character, if you will. The Texas Revolution occurred in 1836. There were some artists, at least, who were there, but apparently no pictures survived from the Texas Revolution. According to one account, there were 21 printers at the Battle of San Jacinto, and I'm sure they spent you know, the rest of their lives writing about it. But this is the only eyewitness picture that I know of that came out of the Texas Revolution. It's a map of the Presidio at Goliad by Joseph Chadwick. Chadwick was a West Point dropout who spent a lot of time in St. Louis with his uncle in his uncle's shop. He got bored by it, so he went to New Orleans and joined the New Orleans Grays and then came to Texas with them and was stationed at Goliad. When uh, Fannin found out that he had some West Point experience, he took uh, Chadwick as his aide and tasked him with mapping the Presidio, which he did. And in his last letter to his family, he sent his drawing of the map to his family and they took it to New York and had it lithographed. This is the only copy of the lithograph that uh, I know of. It's now in a private collection in uh, Texas. It's a very precise uh, lithograph, very interesting. And I'll point to one thing. This little object there, that little uh, wall facing the gate at the Presidio. It was John Brooks's 68 mounted musket barrels, which he had tied together and racked up like that 
so that with a single match, he could light a fuse that would fire all 68 musket barrels at whoever was coming through the gate at the Presidio. Unfortunately, the uh, troops were not in the Presidio when the Mexicans attacked. They were caught out on the prairie, and as you know, that led to Fannin's uh, massacre. But this is the only eyewitness piece I know of from the Texas Revolution itself. There are a number of pieces that result from it, one of which is on display here tonight. Uh, Sam Houston uh, in his Cherokee uniform, accepting the swords of Santa Ana and Coase, and they are, of course, both saying that uh, they had nothing to do with the uh, Alamo. This is the New York view of the settlement of the Texas uh, Revolution. There are imaginary views of the Revolution. This picture of the Battle of Alamo uh, was published, I think, about 1845, but of course it has uh, nothing to do with the actual Battle of the Alamo or how it looked. I'm sure San Antonians would wish it, wish it did look like that at the time, but it didn't. Immediately after the revolution, the uh, Allen brothers, uh, entrepreneurs, land developers from New York, uh, went up Buffalo Bayou from Galveston and staked out an area that they called Houston and published this map uh, in New Orleans. Plan of the city of Houston, published in 1837. And there, there's only about one complete copy that I know of of this uh, map. Uh, and they mailed it, uh, as uh, Edward Stiff said, a splendid map of the city was carried on the wings of the wind to distant places to catch the, in time the greedy speculator and allure the uninitiated. Mr. Stiff's book is an effort to uh, educate them, I guess I could say. Well, and also in 1837, uh, a vi perhaps the most noted visitor to early uh, Houston was John James Audubon. He was in the finishing stage of the Birds of America. Uh, he would wrap it up in 1839. And he had always wanted to go west, and he had been unable to do so. Uh, he had tried to sign on to several expeditions as a naturalist or an artist, and he was unable to do so. After the Texas Revolution, when, when the fighting died down, he had an opportunity to go to Texas, and he took it. He jumped at the chance. He had his son and Edward Harris with him. They landed in Galveston. They spent most of their time in Galveston. His son did a camera lucida view of Galveston, which is not known to exist. And uh, then he took the Yellowstone a ship, uh, famous on the Missouri River, if you are familiar with Carl Bodmer. He took the Yellowstone up Buffalo Bayou to Houston. And he arrived like the month after, or the week after, I believe, celebration of the Texas victory at the Battle of San Jacinto on April the 21st. So he said all the bunting, which of course was wet and dragging down now because of rain, uh, was still up. And of course, he said they were in their ankles, uh, up to their ankles in mud because it was so wet in Houston. Houston really was founded on a swamp. Uh, but he met Sam Houston and he said that was a very memorable experience, which he would never forget. And Houston offered to help him any way he could. There was no way he could help. Audubon later wrote in a note that which I, I can no longer find, but uh, I guess I can quote without uh, stretching it too much. He basically said, nobody here has any money. They're not going to buy my book. <laughs> he also said that he did not find any new birds in Houston. He said, I have seen most of the birds, though, and that gives me the confidence to go ahead and publish because I feel like now, since I didn't find any on this trip, and, and Galveston, the Galveston area is a real flyway. Uh, so he went ahead, went back to England and finished his book. But he'd already started the viviparous quadrupeds of North America, and he had his son with him, and uh, John Woodhouse Audubon, who actually did about half of the quadrupeds, uh, did the picture of the uh, rabbit as well as the armadillo, and other famous images from the uh, quadrupeds. The picture of the capital of the Republic of Texas there is by Mary Austin Holly, who was Stephen F. Austin's cousin and visited Texas a couple of times and was planning to uh, immigrate when Stephen F. Austin died and she, uh, she never did. Well, the Republic of Texas then is established. The uh, Congress of the Republic of Texas uh, put forth a motion to uh, adopt Audubon as an honorary citizen of Texas, but it hit a snag in a committee and, and never, nothing ever came of it, unfortunately. 
Uh, there were other artists and would-be authors who were circulating in Texas at that time. Uh, this one remains anonymous. He did a book called Texas in 1840, which contains this little uh, lithograph of the city of Austin, which is also on view out in the gallery. Uh, it uh, is one of the first pictures of a quote, quote, city in Austin. And this is like the year after Austin was established. It was published by, well, it was uh, done by uh, Edward Hall, who was the uh, Texas consul in New Orleans, was the artist who did it. The lithographer, the next year, moved to Galveston and spent about a year in Galveston trying to set up a shop for engraving, but he was unsuccessful and moved back and really drops out of the record at that point. I don't know what happened to him. Another city that was uh, documented at that time, this is from 1841, uh, Charles Hooten was an Englishman who immigrated to Texas with members of his family. And I think by the time he got to Galveston, he realized they'd made a mistake. Uh, and so uh, he wrote several articles and a book uh, trying to uh, prevent other people from making his mistake. <laughs> this, this is uh, Hooten is sitting on the foreground there on the Gulf side of Galveston, looking toward the bay side where the city is. And this is uh, the best illustration from his book. His book was published in 1847. Uh, and, and unfortunately, that same year, he died from a morphine overdose because he had contracted malaria while he was in Texas and ultimately overdosed himself and died, but not before he had opportunity to write several articles in the book to put on record his feelings of Galveston. He said, as they approached the city, it looked magnificent. The white city set against the uh, background of the sea. And he said, as we gradually approached, we realized that these were all wood shacks that had been whitewashed and you could knock them over with a pea shooter. And he, he said, if the Mexican army only realized that, they would come back. <laughs> At the same, in the same decade, uh, Prince Solms Bronfels read the cabin book by uh, Carl Seelsfeld, his pseudonym, Carl Postel, and was convinced that Texas was a wonderful place for German immigration and established the Adelsverein, a company to encourage German migration to Texas. And these two uh, pieces uh, are, uh, show artwork from the uh, documents that they uh, published. The Adels of Rhine also hired a young uh, uh, scholar, Ferdinand von Romer, to uh, explore the Adels of Rhine property in Texas to see if there were any valuable minerals. Uh, he found a lot of fossils, but no valuable min minerals, and then went back and published this book on the fossils that he discovered in Texas. At the same time, uh, Castroville was being settled by Henry Castro, his surveyor was Theodore Gentile, who was an artist and later spent a long career in San Antonio. He did this view of Castroville to go along with the map of Castroville. You can see the village laid out in the, cur in the crook there of uh, the, the uh, Nueces River. 1844, a visit by Mary Charlotte Ferris Houston uh, and her husband. Uh, they arrived in Galveston on board a yacht uh, a yacht that was well armored and defended and with a crew, which made everybody think that it was a formal visit by uh, British diplomatic personnel, but it was not, or at least if it was, they never revealed themselves. Mrs. Uh, Houston went back home and wrote a two volume book, delightful read, uh, uh, Texas and the Gulf of Mexico. And the frontispiece to each volume, this picture of Galveston is the frontispiece to the volume one, and this picture of Houston is the frontispiece to volume two. And what I want to show you about this is the impact that she had with uh, this book. This is the original view of Houston. It was picked up in the New York Sun the following year. It was picked up in Germany after that. You can see how it's transitioning too. It was even published in Mexico. And finally in 1859, it was published in France, and now we have a railroad and a covered bridge across the Buffalo Bayou. These pictures were published widely, both Galveston and Houston. If you had encountered somebody in 1860 and asked them to produce a picture of Texas, they might well have chosen one of these views because they were published so widely. 1844, the election 
one of the main issues is Texas and slavery. And it's personified here uh, in this uh, caricature. You can see the uh, lady on uh, the shoulders of uh, the two gentlemen. Uh, Van Buren is the presidential candidate that year for the Democratic Party. Andrew Jackson is his sponsor, and he's gouging him from the back and says, stand up to your lick log, Matty. And Matty says, oh, if it were any other sight but that, I can't stand that. And back on the right is James Polk, and he's talking to Dallas, his running mate. And he says, well, you know, she's not so bad. And that presidential salary of $25,000, what do you say, Dallas? So Polk and Dallas embrace Texas, and of course, they are elected. But one of the main issues during that election, of course, is not just Texas, but it is Texas because of slavery. And there's this uh, biting caricature published in New York about 1845, I think, could be 44. We're basing that on the years that we, we know the lithographer was active in New York. Uh, a horrible picture of probably an overseer sitting on what might originally to you look like a bale of cotton, but it turns out to be the back of a shackled slave. And uh, fading on the right side of the picture is the quote, the star of freedom, and it's fading out. And then this picture, all these signatures below the picture honor those who interposed their shield of their vote against the most base and brutal assault ever aimed at the vitals of liberty. In other words, admitting Texas because of uh, the slavery. So they're publishing this lithograph to honor those who opposed the admission of Texas. That, of course, brought about the war with Mexico. One of the best uh, pictures of that war is this, uh, is this lithograph by Daniel P. Whiting. Whiting was with General Taylor when he landed on the coast of what is now Corpus Christi and set up their camp. And he did this wonderful panorama of the camp with Corpus Christi Village in the distant uh, horizon. Um, he intended to do a whole series. The picture is one of five in Army Portfolio Number 1, implying that there's going to be a number two and maybe a number three. And he did a number of pictures in preparation for that. He was even given uh, a duty to do the pictures by the commanders who thought that he was doing a valuable uh, thing. But when he got home to visit his parents, he said the numerous exaggerated and spurious illustrations of a cheap character had so satiated the public curiosity that he gave up on his project. So he only published the first five and nothing beyond that. Of the many illustrations of the war, many of which are on exhibit out here in the hall, uh, there are a number of those. The best one was done, uh, best ones were done in 1852 after the war was over. George Wilkins Kendall, who was the editor of the New, York, New Orleans Picayune and engaged uh, in covering the war, actually was with the troops as they went into Mexico, uh, wrote a history of the war. And in Mexico, he met the artist Carl Nebel and hired Nebel to do a dozen pictures to illustrate his war with Mexico. So the portfolio was about that big. And it was uh, the war between the United States and Mexico, illustrated, uh, published, well, published in New York, but printed in Paris and hand colored in uh, Paris. So there are beautiful illustrations. Where did uh, Neville get his ideas? Well, he says in the introduction that he visited all the battlefields, but I doubt that he visited this one, which is Palo Alto. It's in South Texas near Brownsville because he's put a, a mountain range in the background there. <laughs> And if you've been to South Texas, you know there aren't any mountains uh, <laughs> anywhere around. Uh, perhaps he got the mountain range idea from this illustration from Thomas Bang's Thorpe's book. Thorpe's was another New Orleans newspaper man who was in Mexico and rushed back and wrote a book about it. And he, it's a tree line. He has a line of trees on the horizon. And Nebel possibly mistook those, that tree line for a line of mountains, which he has uh, filled in a little more uh, realistically than Mr. Thorpe. Uh, did. Well, uh, the Germans in Texas are responsible for so many of the illustrations of this period. One of the uh, uh, men in the Adels Rhine, writing back to the owners in Germany, calls them pretty pictures, candy for the immigrants. And indeed they are. 1847 picture of the wharf 
in uh, Galveston. 1847 picture of the village of New Braunfels by an uh, artist named Car Conrad Casper Rordoff, who intended to do a big illustrated book on Texas that would perhaps rival uh, Carl Bodmer's work on the Upper Missouri. But Rordoff got involved in a shootout uh, in Roundtop and was killed shortly after he did this uh, picture. Uh, he didn't live to see the picture published. Uh, the uh, men of the Adelsverein took his drawing and sent it to be published in Germany uh, several years after his uh, death. Uh, Carl Wilhelm von Rosenberg, another immigrant, probably did this lithograph of Round Top, Texas. It's not signed, so we don't know who uh, was the artist and we don't know who was the publisher. But uh, this copy does survive. And Mr. Rosenberg was living in LaGrange, which was only a few miles from Round Top at that time. He later was employed by the General Land Office in Texas and did this picture of the relatively new Texas capital. In San Antonio, Carl G. Von Iwanski, who came to Texas as a teenager, uh, grew up in San Antonio and in New Braunfels, did this view of New Braunfels, which was, of course, sent to Germany to be printed. Uh, Herman Lunkwitz came to Texas uh, with his family, and he said he came with the intent to earn a living as an artist, but he soon learned that that was not going to be possible, living in the frontier village of Fredericksburg. Uh, so he uh, hired out to do uh, images wherever possible, and this is uh, Dr. Ernst Kapp's water cure in uh, the hill country in uh, Texas, which was printed in uh, New York. He also did this picture of Fredericksburg, which he sent to uh, Germany to be printed. And his idea was that he would bring the prints back to Fredericksburg and he'd have the painting and the prints and everybody who bought a print would get a chance to win the painting in a drawing. Uh, but there apparently was uh, some water damage to the prints and I don't think he was ever able to carry I never found he was advertising it at any rate, so he probably wasn't able to carry out that possibility. Plus the fact that the painting is no longer known. Uh, if, if somebody out there has got it, we don't know who it is. Uh, so the painting might have been destroyed in the, in the uh, accident that perhaps destroyed a number of his lithographs as well. He also did this picture of San Antonio a few years later. And these really are the high point as far as uh, uh, landscapes and pictorial illustrations of pre-Civil War Texas are concerned. I love this picture of Indianola, uh, a seaport uh, west of Galveston, which really no longer uh, exists as a seaport because it was wiped off the map by a hurricane in 1888. Uh, but look, no, look at the, uh, the there's flags on the uh, ships, there's flags on the shore, and uh, the copy of this print at the Amon Carter Museum is uncolored. So the flags are blank. Now, the copy at the San Jacinto Museum has all the copy of the flags filled in with Texas flags. So you can take your pick, you know. <laughs> you can have the artist put in whatever flag you want. And then a picture of Galveston, probably about uh, 1860. And uh, I've done all the research I can, really, on C.O. Barr and haven't found anything. The only thing I found is that there was a man named Chaz Bayer, who had a cigar shop in Galveston. So I guess it's possible that he might have wanted to sell these illustrations of Galveston at his cigar shop. But if he did, he didn't advertise it. <laughs> the lithography in Texas occurred during this decade. It was a short-lived effort. And uh, this is the first print. It's a caricature of Sam Houston. And it was done by Wilhelm Tillipoppy. Mr. Tillipoppy was hired by the editors of the San Antonio Zeitung a successful San Antonio newspaper. So successful, in fact, that they were also publishing a Spanish-language newspaper in San Antonio. And they decided they wanted a lithographic shop. So they hired Mr. Tillipoppy as a bright young man, a trained engineer, to run the lithography shop. And Mr. Douay, who was the editor of the newspaper, later wrote quite a story on Tillipoppy. He said, Mr. Tillipoppy, with a lithographic manual in one hand and a used faulty lithographic press from New Orleans reinvented the process of lithography. Uh, he had a hard time doing it, apparently, because the press uh, had too many problems. But this picture of Sam Houston is the very first one that he printed, and there was a write-up in the newspaper 
uh, because it made a little bit of news for Houston, who was a U.S. senator at that time and had been considered as a uh, presidential candidate in the election of 1852, to be so boldly and uh, salaciously attacked. Uh, there are details on the uh, print that refer to Sam Houston being a bigamist because he was married uh, probably at least three times, um, and of course a drunkard, and you know uh, other sins as well. So uh, uh, he was also a member of the Know Nothing Party, or he subscribed to the Know Nothing Party beliefs. They were anti-immigrant, and of course the German immigrants were not anti-immigrant. So they were uh, criticizing him pretty severely in this caricature. Tilly Poppy also did this map of San Antonio, and this is all we have left of it as far as I can find, but it's one of the early maps of the city of San Antonio in which you actually can see uh, some of the old streets of the uh, city. He did this very nice uh, view of the main plaza with the uh, church uh, for a letterhead, uh, and that was the end of his lithographic uh, effort. It, it, the shop failed because there were no customers. You know, he was creating things himself, but no customers. So he closed up shop pretty early. So the first effort that actually produced a lithograph lasted mm, probably less than a year. And the, and the main reason might have been the faulty press. We can't bl blame Tealy Poppy for that. Uh, now, meanwhile, Texas has become a state in the Union, and it is being surveyed. One of the first surveys in 1845 cut across the Panhandle along the Canadian River from uh, Bent's Fort in southeastern Colorado down into New Mexico and then straight across the Panhandle. And one of the most uh, compelling sites they saw apparently was this picture called the Pillar Rock on the Canadian. Mr. Abair, who was the artist, said he did the picture of Pillar Rock because he thought it would be a sentinel for future travelers. Well, if it is, it's not a sentinel for travelers now because I haven't found it yet. <laughs> the uh, map that he did to accompany it, it shows that the Pillar Rock was on the south side of the river. There is a stump of a Pillar Rock left on the north side of the river, but not on the south side. So there might have been more than one uh, Pillar Rock. Uh, Marcy surveyed really much of the same area in 1852 when he was searching for the mouth of the Red River. And uh, he uh, had Schumard with him. Schumard was uh, a geologist and an artist, and Schumard did the pictures to accompany Marcy's uh, expedition. And Marcy, when he saw the picture of what he called the head of the Red River at the top there, paused and caught his breath and said, the stupendous escarpments of solid rock rising precipitously from the bed of the river to such a height as for a great portion of the day exclude the rays of sun were worn away, away by the lapse of time and the action of the water and the weather into the most fantastic forms that required but little effort of the imagination to convert them into works of art. So he's really bringing the whole cultural mindset of landscape America to bear on this uh, canyon view in uh, uh, the panhandle of Texas. And, and that wasn't the mouth of the Red River. That's in New Mexico. It was also copied and reprinted in uh, Hungary. Another expedition also went along the Canadian River. It was one of the Pacific Railroad surveys led by uh, uh, Emil Weeks Whipple. And the artist on that expedition was uh, Heinrich Mulhausen, and he did a number of pictures in the official publication, and then he later wrote his memoirs and included more of the uh, Panhandle of Texas, including the Kiowa and Comanche uh, Indians. And at the same time, the boundary survey, the war with Mexico resulted, of course, in a new boundary between Texas and Mexico and had to be resurveyed. So in that boundary survey, there were some really fine pictures that came out of that survey. This is a picture of what they called El Paso at the time, it's now Ciudad Waters, it's on the Mexican side of the river. Uh, the main artist on that expedition was uh, Arthur Schott, and uh, he did a series of interesting portraits. Mr. Schott really was a botanist, and he was corresponding with John Torrey at Princeton the whole time, so the correspondence is available. And he really believed, I think he believed that plants were sentient, and he paid particular attention to all the plants. And if you notice, he believed that the Native Americans had a real uh, allure about them that the plants understood, and the plants 
are all drawn to the Native Americans. And you can see how they're subtly leaning toward this man. And in this portrait, the same thing. You can see how they're leaning toward or pointing toward the man. And he also did this landscape in which the plants really form a chorus line for the mountains, which are in the background. Now, of course, what he's portraying is the border and uh, perhaps at the same time, a possible railroad route. But in, only, in his heart, what he's doing is he's painting portraits of these uh, plants. Of course, that didn't come out of the uh, official publication. They, they didn't talk about that. You have to go to his correspondence with Tory and others to understand his yearning for the plants. Uh, at the same time, a couple of years later, uh, there's a commercial expedition from Memphis to San Diego to try to find a route for a trans transcontinental railroad, and uh, the artist there is called uh, Carl Schuhard. Uh, Schuhard uh, gives the example. It, it's the only time that I found uh, interchange between the person who was authorizing the view and the person who was doing it. And Gray sent Schuhard out to do a picture and Schuhard came back with, according to Gray, a dumb Sherman, a dumb German sitting in the middle of a bunch of weeds. And Schuhard said, well, yes, if you'd let me pick the spot, I'd do a better job. So, uh, Civil War, uh, you probably are familiar with the lithographs of uh, the coast of uh, the South, which show the ships in the uh, Gulf, the uh, uh, blockade, uh, there was a, this picture shows the Alabama sinking the USS Hatteras. It's one of the few, it's just off the coast of Galveston, one of the few wreck sites that's on the National Register of Historic Places today. And then this is a picture, this suggests one of the main reasons I think Texas was very important during the Civil War. The boundary with Mexico was a neutral boundary, and all the cotton in Texas went out through Mexico and was shipped out because the British and the French were making sure that the United States did not blockade Mexico too. So this is a picture of Baghdad about 1865. That's, that's barely on the southern side of the mouth of the Rio Grande. You see two-story buildings. You see dozens of ships out in the harbor waiting to be loaded with cotton. Baghdad was a large town in 1865. After the war, it disappeared like that. There was no longer any reason for Baghdad. Reconstruction, Texas. This is sort of, I guess, uh, what might be, well, it's one artist's view, maybe a broader view than that. It's anonymous. We don't know who did it. We don't know who printed it, but it's called Young Texas. And O.O. Howard was the uh, commander of the Freedmen's Bureau. He was the man who established the Freedmen's Bureau throughout the South. And he said, Edgar Gregory is so fearless of, the opposi fearless of opposition or danger that I sent him to Texas, which seemed in 1865 to be the post of greatest peril. Texas is the post of greatest peril because Texas really was never defeated. Texas was never invaded. They simply quit fighting, or at least many of them did. Some of them kept fighting. Flake's Bulletin, which was a German and English language newspaper in Galveston. Mr. Flake's was a unionist. He said, the war has educated a class of men into idleness and into a familiarity with deadly weapons that prompts them to resort to the revolver whenever it suits their drunken vagaries. Now, the St. Louis Globe Democrat. In Texas, the life of a man is held in but little higher esteem than that of an ox or a horse. And you know President Chester Arthur's famous quote about cowboys, a band of armed desperados. So Texas was a tough place after the war. It was a violent place, but it was also a place of opportunity. And that's what you see in the lithographs. You don't see the other side in the lithographs, except for the young Texas view. Joseph McCoy was an immigrant from Indiana who came to Dallas as a young man. And he's trying to convince his family and his fiance to join him. And he sent them two copies of the bird's eye view of Dallas and writes in his letter, now about my staying in Texas, you must begin to think about it. If Texas is going to be what all say it is, I expect I can do better here than any place else. Well, the Texas image then has got to improve. A man wrote to the uh, Dallas newspaper and he said, you know, those people in California and New York both think we're a bunch of desperados. So the Texas image needs some work. What is the Texas image? Well, the cowboy becomes part of that Texas image. This is Syringo's, uh, Syringo went on to write an autobiography, which is the first cowboy autobiography. Texas Jack is performing with Buffalo Bill. 
but also there's this view of a prosperous ranch in uh, Texas. And cowboys then are picked up in advertising. And the one on the left, William Black's Range Canning Company, you see a can label for boiled mutton. And the image is, of course, a longhorn <laughs> and a cowboy. And you see a German uh, trading card. You see a song sheet. And you see Mr. Potter of Texas, a, a, a novel based loosely on the life of, uh, of uh, a, a Texas rancher. But here he's riding a, a bicycle with good, good rich tires, Mr. Potter of Texas. So the real change agent in Texas after the war was the railroad, as I said. And this is a, a book that was published on the railroad between Galveston and San Antonio. San Antonio was one of the last large cities in Texas to get the railroad in 18. 77, and the, the booklet is illustrated with all the towns along the route. And at the same time, lithography really finally comes to Texas for the first time, and that's with the Strickland Company in uh, Galveston. And Strickland published this uh, very nice map of Galveston. He published a little booklet of anonymous drawings from the Cotton Exchange building in Galveston. And he also published uh, the Mardi Gras invitations for Galveston, this one after uh, James Henry Mosier, who was a New England artist who was in uh, Galveston for a couple of years because his father was uh, architect for the Cotton Exchange building. Clark and Quartz comes along as a lithography company a few years later, ultimately buys the remnants of the Strickland Corporation. Clark and Quartz becomes the la largest printer in the South and does business in uh, Latin America as well. Clark and Quartz even trademarked the Texas flag. Coyle in Houston was the lithographer who started business there. In Dallas, we have the Dallas Lithograph Company uh, publishing caricatures. That they hired an artist from Puck Magazine, so we have this caricature of, uh, of the uh, gremlin running away with the tax money that would be earned on beverages if we permitted them to continue to sell. And they also did this bird's eye view of the port of Dallas. Uh, suggesting that the Trinity River could be turned into a port for Dallas. And this wonderful little lithograph, uh, this is the frontispiece to a book called Evolution and True Light by William Dunn, who was a hotel owner in uh, Fort Worth. And he's got a picture of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and they're being thrust out of the Garden of Eden for uh, tasting the fruit. Why he did that, I don't know, and there is no explanation in the book, but it's a charming... <laughs> Charming illustration. So there were a number of lithographers. I think all the major cities in Texas had lithographic shops except Austin and El Paso. And Austin went straight into uh, halftone printing. So uh, a flurry of lithographs about Texas during the 19th century. Now, 1900 is uh, an interesting year in a sense because it was the year of the Galveston flood, the Galveston hurricane which is probably still the largest natural disaster in this country's history. But it was also at that time that halftone printing really sort of did a job on lithography as well, because halftone printing made it possible to produce a reproduction of a photograph. And lithography at that point was unable to do that. So most printers turned to halftone printing for a long time, leading Joseph Pennell to write lithography is now relegated to the cigar box maker, the printer of theatrical posters, or the publisher of chromos and comic prints. Uh, but that's not true. We know what happened to lithography in the 20th century. It went on to become the main method of uh, printing. And uh, do you know how they get the M's on the M and M's? Lithography. And also, chips get all those intricate designs printed on them today by lithography. So even in this age of digital printing, lithography is not totally dead. Herman Spies, who was the uh, director of the Adels for Rhine in 1847, said the printing and distribution of such pictures will do more to lure immigrants than newspaper articles. So lithography played a role in the development and populating of 19th century Texas. And I think historians need to look at that influence, whatever it was. It was, in a sense, a filter through which people saw Texas and which we unconsciously maybe see it today. Thanks so much.
Thank you so much, Ron. We have a few minutes for questions. Uh, I have a mic here that I can bring around to anybody in the room who'd like to ask a question. My colleague Amanda Kondek is in the back to take questions from our YouTube audience. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. I'll bring you a mic. Flowers of Texas. Well, there are a number. There are okay. a number. I left them out. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> most of them were engravings, uh, starting with Curtis's Botanical Magazine. There were there were contacts in Texas who were sending Curtis seeds, and Thomas Drummond, uh, who I think came down the Mississippi River, got into Texas, did a lot of research in Texas in the 1830s and went to New Orleans with the intent of going back at home and getting his family and moving, mm -hmm. and uh, died in uh, New Orleans. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure why he died. It might have been malaria. Uh, but he collected a lot of flowers in Texas, and they appear. There are three or four issues of Curtis's Botanical Magazine that are heavily il illustrated with Texas flowers. And then there are some lithographs that appear in uh, the 1850s in another large uh, floral publication, which doesn't have quite the reputation that Curtis's does, but they, they do appear, yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Ron, thank you for a wonderful presentation and great images. Um, I am wondering if the reverse is also true in the sense that did Texas or the expansion westward have any impact on technological innovations in lithography and lithographic culture? So while lithography had an impact on Texas, is the opposite also true? Were there any innovations technically because of the westward movement? I don't think so. The, what I find, and I've, I've forgotten now how many uh, people I identified as working in lithographic shops in, in Texas, but you can do that by using the city directories and the census. And I, I came to well over 100, and uh, actually, in the, in the 19th century, and uh, two of them were actually women. Uh, you know, what role they played uh, is not always clear in the city directories or the census, but that they were involved in a lithographic process of some kind. Uh, but no, these were Englishmen or Germans primarily who were imported. Strickland, when he set up his lithographic shop, brought in a whole new team to uh, run it. None of them were Texans. And uh, there was some learning on the job. His son got involved in the process and became, I think, uh, a lithographic artist. And after uh, the Strickland shop closed, his son went into the Midwest, I think, in Kansas City and continued to work in a lithographic shop there. But as far as uh, any patents or anything like that, not that I'm aware of. They were using, you know, own equipment like everybody else. Other question. I'm wondering if there is any evidence that Texas supplied the stones. Um, Good question. When lithography got so popular, they were looking for lithographic stones all over the country. And inevitably, you know, when you go into a new area, there's going to be a story that we found lithographic stones, <laughs> along with the, uh, oh, well, of course, always gold, uh, limestone for building. You know, I'm working on a book on bird's eye views now, and every city that's founded is founded with the hope that they're going to find that, you know, in them there are hills. Uh, yes, they, dis they did discover stones that could be used for lithography in Texas, and they sent them to the Dallas Lithographic Shop to experiment. They claimed it was successful, but that was the end of the story. <laughs> so I rather expected it was not that, su that successful, uh, but they tried. And they found them in you know several different parts of Texas, and every time they did, there would be a big write-up in the newspaper and lots of hope that now we've got a new industry, because lithographic stones were extremely valuable. They were expensive, one of the one of the largest expenses probably of setting up a shop, 
And that was one of the things, that was one of the reasons, of course, that there weren't that more, weren't more lithographic shops in Texas because the startup was kind of high. Not to mention the ability. Um, that, thanks for this terrific talk. I was wondering what advice you might have for a historian in the 19th century who's not used lithographs in their research, but is freshly intrigued at the prospect. <laughs> Asking for a friend. Well, it, <laughs> <laughs> well, if you stay in the 18th century, it's going to be short. <laughs> You've got 18, 1798 to 1800. 19th century, yeah. Um, you know, lithographs are everywhere. And whatever you're looking for, there may be something there. I had no idea there were this many lithographs relating to Texas. When I started out, I thought maybe a, you know, a thin little volume with a list. And uh, I had a, had a good friend who was working on a catalog of engravings of Texas, and I knew he was in trouble. Because uh, you know, there are engravings in every publication, and he finally published a book about that thick. And it's a catalog. It's not, it's, you know, he doesn't write chapters. He writes entries. It's a catalog of Mavis Kelsey. Uh, and he worked on it for years and had, I know he had people he hired to work on it too. Um, I don't think there are that many lithographs. Probably not. But, uh, you know, they're not all cataloged, so I don't know. And so far as I know, there's nobody really who made an effort to collect lithographs related to Texas, but for one person. Uh, Swante Palm was a resident of Austin. He was uh, a consul for one of the Scandinavian countries. I've forgotten which one, but he was a collector. He was a literary man. And he had a library of about 10,000 volumes, which he gave to the University of Texas, uh, which was the foundation of the University of Texas Library. And he set out to collect a copy of every picture of Texas and the Southwest. Every picture of Texas and the Southwest. I don't know of anybody else who tried to do that consciously. Uh, obviously, uh, any good librarian would accept something like, in, like that into the collection if they had the opportunity, but making it a priority and going after them, no. Uh, and, and the answer is easy to that one, too. Most Texas libraries for years and years and years didn't have that much money, so it would have been dependent on private collectors. And most private collectors were not picture-oriented. We have an organization in Texas now called Cassetta, which talks about early Texas art. And wow, you know, they're really turned on about early Texas art and turning up some very interesting material that, you know, has been out there for years, but not in the public image. So uh, there may be something there, you know. 18th century, 19th century, anything more specific? Well, there should be a lot there, depending yeah. on what. Philadelphia. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you're, you're, that's yeah. that's Lauren you're, Hughes, you're, you're Vice right President place. for Collections, <laughs> Curator of Graphic Arts, encouraging you to come and see her. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a question about color. So, I mean, you talked a lot about the distribution of images, the kind of, even in some cases, the kind of mistakes that are made into the images. And I love that the one of the mountains above, is it Galveston? Um, and I'm just curious if you could talk a little bit about the coloring process, right? These are hand colored, right? I mean, Most of them are hand colored. Right, right. There were some chromolithographs that uh, I've included in my book. Uh, some of the posters, the fair posters and things like that that I showed toward the end were chromolithographs. And there was chromolithography done in Texas. Uh, Strickland did chromolithography, uh, primarily the uh, Mardi Gras invitations that he did. The Galv Galveston started their Mardi Gras celebration about 1867, and it's still going on. And so they, you know, they were, uh, they had their invitations printed in New York and Paris before Strickland was able to do chromolithography. But he started doing chromolithography, so they started letting him print them. Uh, Clark and Quartz obviously did chromolithography. They, that was the, ultimately the best uh, lithography shop in Texas, I think, and the, by far the largest. And uh, as I said, they were doing business throughout the South and in Latin America as well. Um, and uh, so there was some chromolithography, but 
not, not much more than that. And a number of the images that I showed here uh, were hand colored. And perhaps uh, I showed you the only one that exists. The rest of them might not be colored. Uh, that's, that's, a com that's a comment that I did not make in my book. Uh, because uh, I, the picture by Hebert, for example, beautiful little hand-colored picture. None of the rest of them are colored. He, that was his personal copy. So uh, uh, there are some chromola therapies, but not that many. And most of them are ads, if they do exist. Uh, the thing that surprised me is that the railroads, as much material as they published, didn't do more lithography. They did some, and I showed you some, but uh, they did a lot more of engravings. The, the railroads, I think, kind of took a back seat and let the communities do the advertising for them. Uh, and when you read about the railroads going out of business, that's maybe that was a wise decision. <laughs> Ron Tyler, thank you so much for this great evening. Thank you. I'd like to thank Ron Tyler again for launching our Jane Ramsey Pomeroy lectures so well. I think one of the common threads between Ron and Jane is their encyclopedic knowledge of the thing that they have chosen to devote so many years to studying, and we are grateful. Thank you. I want to thank all of you who are here tonight, whether you are here in the room or watching us on YouTube. Uh, if you'd like to recommend this program to friends, it will be available on our YouTube channel within the next several days, as are all of our previous programs. Uh, and for those of you who are here in the room this evening, I'd like to invite you across the street for a reception after this talk um, in honor of Ron and also in honor of Jane Ramsey Pomeroy. We have a small reception. Please join us for that. We have several programs coming up in the next few weeks. Next Tuesday night, September 19th, Allison Stagg will talk about prints, P-R-I-N-T-S, of a new kind, political caricature in the United States, 1789 to 1828. As I've said before, if you think politics now is fierce, just look at the 1790s. <laughs> Next Thursday, September 21st, at 2 p.m., we have a book talk with Kristen Mooker on her recent publication, Before American History, Nationalist Mythmaking and Indigenous Dispossession. There's much, much more, indeed, virtually a program a week from now well into November. Please check those out at our website, AmericanAntiquarian.org, and you can watch all our previous programs on the YouTube channel. For now, thank you so much for being here, and have a good evening.